Hi, everybody. My name is Rafa Lombardino, and this is Translation Confessional. What is the most fundamental tool translators have? Yes, our language. And we must be the grammar and spelling police, not only when we're working on a project, but also when we're communicating with clients or interacting with peers online. We must use our language as well at all times. With that in mind, one tool I've been using for a while now, and I do use it constantly, is Grammarly. I've activated it on my email so I don't make any mistakes when sending a message to a client. I also have it available to me in Google Drive so I can use it when reviewing my students' translations into English or when I'm writing my own articles and brainstorming podcast episodes. And because I do translate into English very often, the premium version helps me keep my last draft sharp and ready for delivery. If you'd like to try out the world's best automated proofreader, visit bit.ly slash tc dash grammar. It's easy to remember. TC stands for Translation Confessional, followed by Grammar. Once again, you can visit Grammarly at bit.ly slash tc dash g-r-a-m-m A-R. Keep your English sharp. These are some of my favorite words. Last week, I talked about some words I don't quite like in my languages because I associate them with other things that have nothing to do with their meaning, or maybe because of how they sound, how they look, or how they don't quite fit grammatically, at least in my mind. Today, I wanted to flip the coin and talk about the other side, the words I actually do like. And, spoil alert! I don't have a real reason for why I like them. I just do. So, starting with my native language, one of my favorite words in Portuguese is actually an expression. Vínculo empregatício. Do you know what that means? Employment relationship. (laughs) Funny thing is that I started out as a freelancer and I haven't really had an employment relationship with anyone for that long, except for my own company. Still, I just like the fact that vínculo empregatício sounds like such a high register word for employment. It actually reminds me of how bureaucratic the regular employment system can be, as if this expression was created just to make things sound more official. Another word I really like in Portuguese is imprescindível, which means fundamental, crucial, essential, indispensable, something you just cannot do without. I don't know about you, but to me, all these words in English don't seem to have the same weight and urgency as imprescindível. The nice thing is that the same word exists in my other two languages. Imprescindible is Spanish, and imprescindible is Italian. The fact that we use im, I am, as the prefix indicates a negation, not in the negative way, but rather as something that cannot be missing. In English, indispensable gets a bit closer to it using the in, I am, prefix. But it just doesn't make me feel the same way in my gut. It's almost as if something indispensable sounds like an over-the-top request that, oh my gosh, I can't live without it, you know? While imprescindível is a requirement of utmost importance and everything else will fall apart without it. Then there's fugaz, which means fleeting, ephemeral, 
transient. One of my earliest memories as a child is of a song that came out in 1984 when I was four years old, and the title of the song is kind of a play of words on fugaz because it's almost spelled as full gas in English. So, come to think of it, while the song could be interpreted as being about ephemeral love, it's also about going full throttle, stepping on the gas, and experiencing this fleeting love story. Apart from that, full gas could also be interpreted as something positive, like it gives me energy, it pumps me up. And I can assure you it has nothing to do with something giving you gas and making you cut the cheese. So, Fugaz is a high register word in Portuguese and sounds pretty poetic, but was popularized in the mid 1980s in Brazil because of this pop ballad that people my age will remember listening to as a kid. And finally, we have saudade, which is so fleeting, known as one of the untranslatable words in Portuguese. Yes, there's no direct translation for it, not as a word for word kind of translation, but it's the feeling of longing for something, someone, someplace, or sometime. The closest we can get when explaining what saudade means is when we compare it to being homesick, when you're missing your home, you're nostalgic about it. And that's what saudade means, as a general feeling associated with objects, people, places, or a time in your life. And in Portuguese, we do go over the top and say, morrendo de saudade, which literally means you might as well die of nostalgia if you can't appease your need for what you've been missing or longing for. Before we continue, I wanted to tell you about Better World Books. It's a great website to search for new and used books in several categories. You can find textbooks about translation, interpretation, and languages, as well as translated and original fiction and nonfiction. Some deals qualify for free shipping, which can really come in handy when you're on a budget. If you'd like to check out Better World Books, go to this webpage, bit.ly slash tc dash bwb. It's easy to remember. TC for Translation Confessional and BWB for Better World Books. Once again, the webpage is bit.ly slash tc dash bwb. Hope you like it. Moving on to my words in English. I've reflected on this and I have to say that one of my favorite words in my second language is serendipity. I must have mentioned it a few times already here at Translation Confessional because I do believe things sometimes happen by chance in a happy or beneficial way. It's that idea that you found just what you needed even though you didn't even know you were looking for it. Recently, I had two serendipitous events when I was browsing social media during one of my breaks, and I came upon two translators that I'll interview to talk about some very interesting subjects in audiovisual translations. But you have to wait for season three to listen to what they have to share. In the meantime, here's another word in English that I really, really like. Albeit. Actually, it's one of those words that I had seen written in books and articles several times. I understood what it was and knew how to use it, but the entire meaning and function of the word only sunk in when I was reading a book while following along with the audiobook and I heard the author saying it aloud. I realized I had been saying it wrong in my head all along until I was actually able to combine the visual and the sound to internalize the meaning. Now, every time someone says, albeit, I feel this little wave of electricity going through my brain, which is the same kind of excitement I would feel as a nerdy little kid learning new words in English all those years ago. 
Actually, I looked for examples of albeit and came across the short paragraph whose author I just could not find. So I'm assuming it was created randomly by yourdictionary.com. They're supposed to be individual sentences, but they go so well together. I'm now intrigued by the plot of this non-existent novel that could contain such a passage. She rose, albeit unsteadily, and he grasped her in the now familiar position of his supporting arm about her waist. It was an interesting conversation, albeit one-sided. Once again, she abided by his wishes, albeit reluctantly. He had even made the coffee, albeit insipidly. Something else that kind of has the same effect on me and also puts a smirk on my face whenever I get to use it in a translation or in real life is this expression, or lack thereof. It sometimes functions similarly to albeit, as in introducing an alternative or opposite idea to what you just said. In a way, I usually feel this expression as kind of throwing shade, you know? As if you were describing something and just gave someone the side eye and said, well, that would have been the case, but it doesn't seem like you have what it takes, darling. The examples I found for lack thereof weren't as cinematic as the one I found for albeit, but here's a general idea. It was getting more difficult to judge each film on its own merits, or lack thereof. People's social habits, or lack thereof, also affect their interesting movies. What is notable about this movie, however, isn't the plot, or lack thereof, which would just make it another lame action flick. Time for some of my favorite Spanish words now. The first one has to be sobremesa, which literally means over the table, but rather represents the time you spend at the table talking and enjoying each other's company after a meal. The funny thing is that this very same word in Portuguese means dessert, which in turn is postre in Spanish. So I've always wondered how they're related. If there are any etymologists listening to this episode right now, drop me a line and let me know whether Portuguese borrowed the word from Spanish to use it with a completely different meaning. Here's another word, and it's kind of food-related too. Antojito. That's the diminutive of antojo, which means something fancy, extravagant, but... I associated it more with the notion of craving something. I actually like antojito way better than antojo because the latter reminds me of nojo in Portuguese, which means disgust. So it doesn't quite go with the idea of craving something or the guilty pleasure you get from doing something on a whim that you could go without, but you just feel like doing it anyway. Actually, another word for that feeling of doing something because you deserve it, because you're worth it, would be capricho in Spanish. And it's written the exact same way in Portuguese, but we say it differently. Capricho. So, antojito and capricho are the words I associate with this feeling of craving something or acting on a whim. Now, another word that kind of goes with sobremesa and antojito for me is actually a word that I'm not quite sure I can say with a straight face. Here he goes. Carajillo. (laughs) If you speak Portuguese, I'm sure you're giggling like a fifth grader right now. Carajillo actually sounds like a dirty word, which I'm not going to get into right now. But it's just a coffee cocktail that you could have after you eat especially if you're talking to someone you just shared a meal with. 
So it classifies as kind of a guilty pleasure, something you could be craving, almost like a dessert in the form of a drink. I associate it with Irish coffee, even though the recipe isn't exactly the same, but either one of them, after a meal, while I'm catching up with friends, sounds wonderful, actually. Finally, I'll wrap up this episode with a couple of Italian words. The first one is incinta, which simply means pregnant. I think I like this word because I had to try hard to make it stick to my brain, since it doesn't resemble the words we use in my other Romance languages. In Portuguese, we say grávida, which I don't quite like because it reminds me of grave, as if pregnancy were a grave, severe condition. In Spanish, it's embarazada, which I believe is the classic example of a false friend between Spanish and English, since it does not mean embarrassed, nor does it mean tangled in Portuguese, even though the pronunciation is pretty similar. Embarazada for pregnant in Spanish and embarazada for tangled in Portuguese. But I'll always remember Incinta affectionately because when we went backpacking through Italy, we knew we would soon start a family. So it was the last big trip for my husband and me, just the two of us. I remember mentioning it to the cousins we found in Sicily, one of whom worked at a hospital and said he could get some blood work done for me the same day. I told him, Io non sono ancora incinta, to let him know I wasn't pregnant yet. So I'll always associate the word incinta with the feeling of actually expecting a child, that is, the expectation of soon becoming pregnant and starting a family. And the second word I'll highlight today that is in Italian and that I like is something I also associate with that trip. Tipo. Seeing and hearing the word being used by native Italian speakers in the wild, so to speak, I realized how we use it so similarly in Brazil. It has several uses, actually. You can say tipo or tipo in Portuguese to mean type or typical, or even to refer to a guy you don't know, like that dude over there is staring at you, or that strange guy just walked into the store. It's fascinating how such a simple word could be used the exact same way as a slang in two countries divided by the Atlantic Ocean and that speak a different language. So those were some of my favorite words in my working languages. How about you? What are some of the words you like the most in the languages you speak or are currently studying? Drop me a line or leave me a comment, whether you came to this episode on Anchor, social media, or YouTube. I'd love to hear from people willing to share their favorite words and the emotional connection you've created with them. Send me an email at rlombardino at wordawareness.com or leave a voice message on my Anchor page. If I get enough feedback and voice messages, I can go back to the subject and post a special podcast episode with everyone's opinion on this very same theme. By the way, my Anchor page is anchor.fm slash translation dash confessional. I look forward to hearing from you. Stay tuned for weekly episodes and subscribe to Translation Confessional through your favorite podcast app.